Really the big breakthrough came for me with a very powerful mushroom journey on October 20th, 2018 which uh, very, pretty much launched me. And, uh, and it's, been, it's been quite a journey since then. Yeah, it's been amazing. Um, since then, and then six months later, we passed Decrim Nature. Mm -hmm. Now we're in 100 cities, 30 states, five countries in terms of members of, of this movement. Wow. Uh, we have about another half dozen cities passing the resolution. So it's been one hell of a roller coaster uh, that really, for me, germinated in that one uh, mushroom journey because of the level of clarity it gave me uh, about my own uh, childhood trauma and really how to heal from that. But after that mushroom journey, uh, I, it was very challenging for me to understand what happened to my brain that I could suddenly see the world from so many different perspectives, that I could suddenly be having these conversations with myself that were far more enlightened than I was able to have before the mushrooms. So the resolution is beautiful. It's so simple. It simply says uh, in, in, in multiple uh, whereases and, and therefore be it resolves that um, our relationship to entheogenic plants and fungi should be the same as our relationship to tomatoes, the same as our relationship to an orange, orange tree, to herbs we want to grow in our garden, that there is nothing fundamentally different between our relationship. There should not be anything fundamentally different between our relationship to uh, entheogenic plants and fungi, consciousness healing plants, and an orange. That it's that. decriminalized. There's no controls on how much you grow. I can share it with friends. Our goal at the end of the day would be to get all plants and fungi removed from Schedule 1. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site at the beautiful New West Summit, the Cannabis Tech Conference. We are now going to be talking with Carlos Plazola. Hi, Carlos. Hi. Thanks so much for coming on our show. Really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. So pumped for this conversation. Carlos is the co-founder of Decriminalize Nature Oakland. Carlos, let's start things off by talking about your journey. Who are you? How you even got interested in this space? Yeah, actually, it's been quite a journey. I uh, started somewhere around the age of 10, but I'll, I'll leave out some minor details. Uh, it, it, the journey starts with me trying to find my, uh, my clarity about what this world is and what it means and yeah. try to heal from some childhood trauma. Uh, it takes me through my uh, going to college and getting my degree in environmental science, living amongst the, uh, the Oshawa community in the rainforest at the age of 23 in pursuit of the sacred. Um, and then, uh, then comes life and family, and, and I, I get a, a beautiful wife, children. I'm living the day-to-day uh, -day life of making money and, and all of that. And then, uh, then I have this particular severe trauma hit with my mother passing, and uh, the, the extended family kind of begins to disintegrate with all of that, and uh, relationships disintegrate. And uh, so I went through this healing process, uh, and. Uh, found my way to meditation, yoga, and, and then, but really the big breakthrough came for me with a very powerful mushroom journey on October 20th, 2018, which uh, very, pretty much launched me. And, uh, and it's, been, it's been quite a journey since then. Yeah, it's been amazing um, since then. And then six months later, we passed Decrim Nature. Mm -hmm. Now we're in 100 cities, 30 states, five countries in terms of members of, of this movement. Wow. Uh, we have about another half dozen cities passing the resolution. So it's been one hell of a roller coaster uh, that really, for me, germinated in that one uh, mushroom journey because of the level of clarity it gave me uh, about my own uh, childhood trauma and really how to heal from that. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Whoa. Let's, yeah. let's also go to the, um, if, we, if we could go all the way back to the childhood. What sure. was what was going on um, for you growing up that was making it difficult? Sure. Yeah. No. I'm I'm the uh, child of uh, immigrant parents. Uh, my father himself was uh, left when he was very young. Didn't know how to really be a father. So very soon after I was born, he kind of bailed, and so mom was left to raise her kids by herself. And uh, here how in the U.S., three kids. Three, yeah. She had about twenty bucks in her pocket. We took a midnight train literally out of Mexico and uh, landed in the U.S. with some family. We uh, you know, struggled in terms of, she struggled in terms of working long hours to make money, so I was in many ways sort of raising myself 
And then uh, soon thereafter, she met a man who was an alcoholic, and that came into the family. We had, uh, you know, the, the physical abuse. We, uh, there was uh, alcoholism. There was yelling. There was, there was a very unsettled moment. In, and so uh, as, a, as a being that really loved peace and loved beauty, uh, to be immersed in this really hectic and violent world uh, sent me searching. What's it all mean, right? Yeah. So that was sort of me up until the age of uh, 16 and uh, 17, and then this I left home. This is pre-Oshawa. This is, oh yeah, Oshawa was in uh, 20, 24 years old, 23 years old, I, I lived with wow. the Oshawa. So okay, it this was today. like in my early uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. You were searching for the root purpose of <laughs> yeah. when you were Yeah, why was I searching so <laughs> what? young? What? Wow. Yeah, so the way that came about was, um, Someone told me that uh, someone in my family, this is kind of the genesis, this is the spark, the seed, if you will, of my own searching in the world. At the age of around eight or nine, uh, someone told me that someone in my family died, right? And so then I said, well, what happens when they die? Like, where did they go? And they said, well, they go to heaven where they live forever. So initially I was like, okay. And then I went to bed and I'm like, okay, forever. Try to imagine what that is. So I'm like eight years old, right? So then I started obsessing with what forever meant. And it really became, from the age of eight until 23, I obsessed about it and uh, couldn't figure it out. So it sort of became this fascination with zero and the infinite, zero yeah. being the end and nothingness. And then the infinite, of course, is where does forever go? Yeah. So, um, but that, while it was traumatic, it also helped push me through uh, a lot of the trauma because mm. from that state of realizing there's something far more you know, esoteric than us, being punched in the head is a pretty minor thing, right? So uh, it allowed me to sort of rise above the trauma. So when I was ready to leave home at uh, 17, 18, I um, got into uh, biology and anthropology, which were natural for me because I wanted to understand this planet, life, humans, what all this was. So that was my first sort of venture into what I what really began a pursuit of, of beauty and, and sacred. Wow. Uh, all right. So. <laughs> I really appreciated how you were like, walking us through this divine search that you embarked on as just a young little lad. And also just having something that could be like an anchor for you like this, uh, this forever mm -hmm. uh, throughout that process. And then what was the, you know, when you're 23 Ashwad? You said the Ashwad. 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 They're the uh, uh, original headhunters in the rainforest that we read about, that we see in movies. Uh, they're also known as the Hibaro. And they live in the Amazon rainforest in Ecuador, in uh, Colombia, northern Colombia. Uh, so the way that came about is I'm a biology major at UCLA. Uh, my professor, uh, Dr. Robert Bailey, tells a story about how he left uh, Wall Street after couple, you know, 10, 15 years of success, feeling empty, and so he went to live in the rainforest with a tribe in the, um, in the uh, um, uh, in Brazilian rainforest, and I was just fascinated. So I said, I, I have to do that. So how do I do that? And he said, well, there's this husband and wife team out of Santa Barbara that are going down there, PhD students that are finishing up some research, and I said, okay, I need to go. So he said, well, let me put you in contact with them. I called them. They told me, well, if you really want to go, learn how to do health studies, particularly using calipers so we could do health studies uh, based on um, the indigenous folks becoming uh, sedentary because of oil companies um, using their labor for uh, search of oil. And so I did that, I showed up, uh, and next thing you know I'm on a dual, dual plane, dual engine plane <laughs> heading into the rainforest. It was an hour in off the, uh, off the nearest city, which is Puyo, and we're flying in, and an hour later, we're coming on this little landing strip right in the middle of the rainforest. And I'm thinking, what the hell did I just do? <laughs> right? And it's not just any group. These are the famous headhunters, the Hibaro, right? And, um, but it was absolutely a tremendous experience. They were welcoming. They were loving. Um, and, but because they were sedentary, after, you know, typically they were nomadic, they uh, didn't uh, particularly share food because their meat resources were being depleted. Right? That was one of the effects. That was why we went to study it. And uh, so the effect of all of that was they didn't share their meat much, so I ended up losing 30 pounds, 
because I wasn't a very good hunter-gatherer, it turns out. <laughs> uh, little kid from East San Jose wasn't a very good uh, hunter-gatherer, it turns out. <laughs> but it, I survived, I made it, it was beautiful, and uh, I had an opportunity to do ayahuasca there with, in a true uh, shamanistic, exp uh, curandero experience, and uh, in a circle with the village, villagers, so it was, it was a very beautiful experience. I found the sacred there, by the way. <laughs> Tell us more about that finding. Uh, tell you more about that finding. Oh well, it, um, they live connected to the land. They live connected to each other. Everything is sacred, right? It's um, it, the they know the plants for their medicine. They know the plants for their food. They see their ancestors in the plants. They see their ancestors in each other in the actions that they do. Everything has meaning, right? And that's the sacred, right? So. In, it, one of the most challenging things was coming back into Western civilization at the time because now I had found the sacred and now I'm going back to the land that had not been particularly kind to me. So uh, I experienced the emptiness that, uh, that we experience sometimes in the West that leads us to the use of opiates and depressions and all those things. Um, but really at that point it really, uh, I engaged in trying to figure out how to create social change for um, preservation of the planet, social justice. So uh, about a month later, I found myself at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And uh, so now from the rainforest, I'm walking the halls of Yale. So it was pretty, pretty uh, trippy experience. <laughs> you know, life is nothing if from not trippy. From, <laughs> yeah. from losing 30 pounds is a poor uh, inability to hunt and gather your own <laughs> food to back in the halls of uh, the cafeteria yeah. and the, uh, the Ivy League. Uh, well, that, and that was the extreme, right? It's the Ivy League. We're talking about people with tremendous privilege to people who are struggling just to survive and preserve their ways. So it was uh, yeah. a pretty big uh, dichotomy of uh, worldviews. But so I absorbed it all just to try to expand my own worldview. That's very awakening to get those stark dichotomies. That's right. Very That's right. awakening. Yeah. 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 And and so from there, a lot of my peers, uh, we had a decision to make. My peers and I about what we would do with our future. So for me, I chose to follow the path of love, uh, which was really how do I step forward into the world in a way where I'm coming at it from the heart. And so I did organizing with um, a pastor there who was working with formerly incarcerated. And then I, uh, from there I went into uh, community organizing, worked with ACORN, I did social justice organizing, environmental justice organizing. And, uh, and then from, from there I went into political organizing, running campaigns, working in government, all the while just learning the tools of creating change. And, uh, and then I went into business because if you can't figure out the capitalist model, then you really can't function in this world. So for the last 15 years, I've been learning financial modeling uh, and the world of capitalism. So when that day came, October 20th, 2018, and I had that kind of big moment of clarity about my own path and where I was, it was pretty natural next step to take all those tools and then put them to work to push for the dec decolonization of, of the very thing that sort of liberated my own consciousness. Right? It was, it was a way of saying thank you to, mm. the, to the plants. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so we have this process that you had of working on social justice and environmental causes and oh, just causes for, for further catalyzing awakening in other people over time and you're picking up strategies uh, along the way and you wanted to implement that for specifically decrim nature. So yeah, how did the idea seed for decrim nature and walk us yeah. through? Yeah. So I'll give you my, uh, my path. Of course, everyone who was at the table had their own path to the table. Um, but uh, after that mushroom journey, uh, I, it was very challenging for me to understand what happened to my brain that I could suddenly see the world from so many different perspectives, that I could suddenly be having these conversations with myself that were far more enlightened than I was able to have before the mushrooms. Um, and it confused me in many ways, so I went in search of community. And this is now, we're, uh, ayahuasca experience with the curandero it was, was just two, 23, 24 years old. Yeah. And then the mushroom experience was just a, ye how long? a year ago. A year ago. Yeah, a little less than a year ago. And between that was not, what was that, not too much? Well, the ayahuasca experience didn't really do much because it was very light. It was very light. Yeah, okay. so all it did was give me a deeper sense of sensory experience. Heightened vision and hearing. 
that's all they did. But you also had the uh, understanding of the interconnectedness of, of the, the tribal indigenous uh, lifestyle and stuff. So, so I understood big. the sacred from the intellectual perspective, ah, from okay. the cerebral cortex perspective, so to speak, the mind, the brain. I understood it intellectually, right? People say you understand yeah, God intellectually. Intellectually, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> versus the feeling. Yeah, the very deep knowing. Knowing, yeah. 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 So, so that was in between 23 to 50. Wow. And so there was still a struggle, and, and it would manifest in if I was under high duress, uh, if I felt as if I was being attacked, I would go into self-protection or even uh, counter-attack mode, which is something we see in PTSD, something we see in people who have been abused where it's about self-protection. There's an immediate place of yeah. uh, assuming you're being attacked. Um, and, uh, and so I recognize that. I've known that about myself at least for the last five years due to a lot of deep meditation. Okay, so you meditation was a big connecting thread over yeah. those 20 plus years. Yeah, yeah, sorry. It, when I was 20, uh, when I'm sorry, when I was uh, 44, 45, my mother passed. Mm. So about six years ago, my mother passed away and that sort of reawakened a lot of the childhood mm. trauma. Uh, because my sister, brother, and I were not prepared to know how to deal with that level of complexity of trauma. And we didn't have the tools because we weren't given those tools when we were young. And how do you work through these challenges, right? Wow. In a way that isn't yelling or screaming or fighting, right? Because that's what you're taught. That's what we were taught. So, uh, so now I'm seeing all of this disintegrate around me, relationships breaking down, people getting into deep, deep depression around me not knowing how to function in the world. And I'm looking around thinking, what do I do with all this? So I started with myself and said, let's try healing the self first. And as I went, did that, I went into yoga, then I found Shavasana. When I found Shavasana, I said, what is this thing, consciousness? I'm suddenly recognizing there's this other state of being uh, where you're aware of your own awareness. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so from there, I went deeply into meditation, meditating almost daily, well, daily for about two years. Uh, and as I um, went through that process, I sort of let go of all of the trauma, everything that was binding me, but I still had the reaction. I still was reacting from a place of um, self-protection, uh, anxiety when I felt under duress. So I realized that there was something in my brain that wasn't in, under my control, even with meditation, right? So. And I, and I figured that I could not break this cycle, that I was forever going to be trapped in this uh, self-defense mode when under duress. And that's when I was ready to give up. I read Michael Pollan's book, uh, and I said, I got to try these mushrooms, because apparently they do a pretty good job. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where I went into the um, ceremony with a friend. I had my five gram journey. Wow. Uh, you know, they closed the door behind me, I locked it, and uh, I said, I'm coming out when I'm done with processing these five grams. And uh, it was a pretty uh, tremendous journey. I felt that default mode network. Now I've come to understand what happened. And what happened was that I was trapped in this cycle of neuron firing that reacted, just reacted. And I couldn't overcome it because it was just too built into my um, network system, neural network system. So. Um, so then that's when I started searching for community and found this very, very strong community of you know, psychedelic community in the Bay Area that included doctors, nurses, therapists, scientists, botanists. And I said, wow, what the hell is this? And where have you been all my life, right? Um, and so then we had a meeting. We all sat down at a table and uh, started just introducing ourselves. As I introduced myself, I said I used to work in government. I worked in the Oakland City Council. My job was to get legislation passed. So if you all want to pass something, I'm happy to help. And at the very end, Dr. Gary Kono, who was there with us, said, I think we should pass a resolution. And uh, everyone else agreed, and so that's sort of what started it uh, rolling. So from there, that was uh, December of 2018. And then by January and February, we wrote the resolution. Uh, by March, we're meeting with council members. By April, we have a sponsor. Wow. By May, we're at public safety, and by June, we pass it unanimously. And now the rest is... Uh, six history. months? Yeah, six months. Wow. And the resolution. Teach us about the resolution. That's so the resolution, uh, I think, is a beautiful resolution. It's one year ago passed. So one year on the 20th of October. It will be one year. Will it be? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
So the resolution is beautiful. It's so simple. It simply says uh, in, in, in multiple uh, whereases, and, and therefore be it resolves, that um, our relationship to entheogenic plants and fungi should be the same as our relationship to tomatoes, the same as our relationship to an orange, orange tree, to herbs we want to grow in our garden, that there is nothing fundamentally different between our relationship. There should not be anything fundamentally different between our relationship to uh, entheogenic plants and fungi, consciousness healing plants, and an orange. That it's that. decriminalized. There's no controls on how much you grow. I can share it with friends. And if I choose to create a factory to take my oranges and make orange juice, now I plug into pre-existing um, regulatory systems that are already in place. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so our resolution doesn't go that far. It simply says if you're going to grow it for personal use, to share, uh, and to enjoy without the process of commodification that is for sale or, or um, commercial sales or commercial cultivation, that there's no constraints, no controls, no government interference between that relationship. So, and we think that's the way it should be on planet Earth. So. Wow. What yeah. a progressive bill. So simple though, isn't it? It is. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I love the, the analogy to, to a relationship with tomatoes or an orange tree. Uh, I, I love that. That was really eloquently written that with, entheogen, with entheogens and with fungi shall be uh, similarly treated. Yeah. And that's very elegant. I like that. Yeah, the only reason not to do it is fear. Right? And that's the only argument we've ever heard against this from people is what if somebody does this? What if a child gets a hold of it? What if? And, uh, but then you, you go to the next step. What if a child eats these? Well, what if a child decides to cross the street with a bus coming, right? There's a certain... There's certain things that we as parents, as adults, are supposed to help guide children through, including don't give them don't powerful eat mushrooms. Five <laughs> grams of, yeah, powerful. Nevertheless, uh, yeah. poisonous, deadly mushrooms are not illegal. So if we're going to say, why, you know, what if a child eats these? What if a child eats those? But we don't seem to have the impetus yeah. to make those illegal. So then what does, uh, I, I, I liked how you guys said when um, at the next level it would be a, uh, a plugging into the existing regulatory framework if someone was to go beyond uh, just going for their own consciousness healing mm -hmm. uh, using entheogens and, and fungi. But how about then for, uh, you know, purposes in the last year, like what have you seen happen from that? Like what has come up like what have people been doing just like uh, you know having entheogens be decriminalized what is that like mm -hmm. well currently we still have the state and federal um, laws in place which we're working on hopefully changing soon and this is city of this Oakland. is city of Oakland yeah. yeah so then if you're in just the city mm -hmm. yeah it's only the uh, local police and local prosecutors that uh, will not um, take any action or prosecute against anyone with those materials, plant materials. What a um, but, a, but a federal government, federal official seeing somebody using them, yes, it's still federally illegal. It's still illegal at the state level. So that is our next kind of ground to go after and, and really, our goal at the end of the day would be to get all plants and fungi removed from Schedule 1. Because if you think about it, there's no way to get them removed by testing because you test compounds, individual compounds. You might test psilocybin, but a mushroom is not psilocybin. A mushroom mm -hmm. is many different compounds. So plants and fungi never should have been put on Schedule 1 because you can't test them off Schedule 1. So I think we may consider uh, broader action towards the federal government that seeks to remove all plants and fungi from Schedule 1, as well as looking at uh, how folks might engage in a relationship with plants and fungi in a sacred, ceremonial, sacramental way yeah. um, that, that is protected under church uh, freedom of religion. Hmm. Ah, interesting. So my uh, inalienable rights uh, for yes. uh, my uh, spiritual ascension technologies of plants and fungi. Yes, if you approach it as a sacrament for personal religious healing purposes, it should not uh, be infringed upon by the government. This is such a beautiful expression of consciousness right now because uh, it's like uh, indigenous people have for the longest time just been living with the land and with each other and with these plants, fungi, and then uh, yeah. 
The government has helped, of course. Uh, people organize themselves into uh, states and countries and... Uh, so. May I opine on that for a moment? Thank you. Um, yes, there are beautiful <laughs> things that come from government. There are beautiful things that come from capitalism. They are technologies. And we embrace these technologies because they help us to do wonderful things. But we should also be open and aware that as we're evolving as human beings, as human societies, that there are costs to these as well that we have to now clean up, right? Uh, and we're seeing that with climate change. Uh, so we have to uh, recognize that while um, capitalism is good, it also has impacts. So how do we begin to transform that? We don't have to throw it away, we just transform, transform it. it. To version two, it. version three. That's right. The code updates, yeah. To Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like you got it. Um, damn, there's some, yeah, there's some archaic uh, codes with plant and fungi. Yeah, plant yeah. and fungi. That's, that's, that's really um, serious because those uh, have a lot to do with uh, consciousness ascension and healing, which are uh, paramount to having a well-functioning uh, self, family, civilization at large. Yeah, yeah. One might speculate that when these uh, plants uh, and fungi were being co-evolved with humans, and we were uh, using them to bring peace into our own villages. There were other times per perhaps we used them to understand our enemy better, uh, but certainly we used them to help advance our own consciousness to live as a community, uh, also to raise our awareness, to see trends, to understand patterns in the, in, 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 in the um, uh, ecosystems. We were elevating our consciousness with these plants, so it's um, yeah. very interesting that here we are now as a species trying to figure out how we survive ourselves, and uh, and these plants are there as gifts to help guide us. So let's talk on uh, on what what has happened in terms of like uh, business. So when a city does you know make these incremental steps like you listed, uh, and then is able to do something like uh, um, decriminalize psilocybin uh, or fungi and entheogens. What, what is able to um, transpire afterward for, um, for people, you know, this more maybe freedom with the feeling like they're more free to engage with those um, entheogens, which is really beautiful in a sense, mm -hmm. the fungi. Mm -hmm. But um, also does it seem like there is, you know, the, has in the last year, has there been businesses that have uh, emerged and what do those look like? And, yeah, not not so much yet because of the state and federal they uh, can't. restrictions. They, they can't. can't. They can't even incorporate. Correct. As, uh, That's right. That's right. You can't just say I'm uh, grow. Yeah, because they plug into the same regulatory framework That's right. again, and that is. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. So what we're looking at in terms of the evolution at the local level, uh, and, and which is actually where we'd really like to put our energy as decrim nature is throughout various communities around in the U.S. and around the world, if it if it grows to that is how do we uh, support the local emergence of their own relationship with these plants and fungi. Okay. Right? Growing, so helping grow, them gather, locally. gift. Grow, gather, gift. So helping people grow their own, helping people gift, uh, gather and gift to, grow, to friends. Gather, yeah. Hmm, interesting. The gather, because uh, it's, a, it's a naturally a growing um, Phenomena, so you can gather rather than even have to you know, grow specifically in your right. Well, you safely gather. Yeah, yeah. And, and that really all that's saying is, uh, in you know, in East Oakland we have a, a beautiful uh, nursery that is run by formerly incarcerated individuals who do the work, and then they sell the plants. Well, what a beautiful thing if they could grow. Uh, mushrooms or grow Banisteriopsis capi and chacruna for ayahuasca and they could share this in a responsible way, share this medicine uh, with other people in their own community uh, and, uh, and help each other heal that way. So um, it, it's a healing relationship you establish. Now that will happen at the local level and we're pretty uh, sophisticated enough to know that on top of that there will be many, once, especially once this becomes state and federally legal, there's going to be a whole lot of commodification that happens. Yes, yes. So that's that's not our agenda. If yes. people want to do that, that's up to them. But ours is really to help build community around these plants and fungi. Yes, by yes. By having a direct relationship with them. And they can these communities that are interested in um, the entheogen and uh, fungi uh, um, uh, process of, of bringing them into the communities, decriminalization of them. Do you have a uh, protocols? frameworks that they just 
download or how do they, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we actually do have, thank you for using the word framework, uh, we actually have what's called the Oakland Framework for Entheogenic Use, Entheogenic Plant and Fungi Use, and it's a seven, eight page document we created at the request of city council. They said, uh, one of the council members, Lauren Taylor, actually asked us to create some uh, protocols to ensure the protection of people in his community, because it's largely African American community. They don't have a lot of experience in that community with uh, antigenic plant and fungi use. And so he wanted us to bring the information that we could gather uh, forward to make available to not only his community, but communities throughout the U.S. who will be new to this uh, arena. So we consulted with doctors, therapists, nurses, psychiatrists, longtime facilitators without initials next to their names. And uh, we created a, se a seven page Oakland framework for uh, entheogenic um, plant and fungi use. And it uh, goes everywhere from preparation to microdosing as a, a good way to start, all the way to reciprocity when you've gone through the entire process of uh, self healing. The last piece of that is reciprocity. Yeah. So. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's so cool. Okay, so then uh, now able to yeah be downloaded and use this framework um, and hopefully to like you said each community has will have its own unique relationship with entheogens and fungi and they'll get to decide how to properly right. decriminalize and yeah. what to do. Um, so then it seems like it could then uh, maybe not yet businesses but you can maybe set up a meetup and all go hang out in the park and right. you know and yeah go yeah. through conscious healing and ascension together yeah uh, yeah and then what it, it has enabled facilitators to be a f uh, facilitators for those who don't know is just people who are well trained and helping people go through the journey right yeah, so it enables um the entheogenic psychotherapy sessions so healers and um, psychotherapists can then work with these entheogens and fungi? Well, if they have a certification for a, as, a, a, as a therapist with a capital T, then they're still not allowed because that is, a, a, I believe, a certification granted to them by a government body that is not local. I believe it's state. But then non-capital T government that's right. certified. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. Yeah. So people who have been doing this for a long time can feel safer in providing ceremony in yes, their community. Yes and help and them facilitate that experience. Provide ceremony in the community and then also maybe making it based on gift base. Yeah, uh, that's right. Like you said, your last that's row right. gather gift. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Um, how do we uh, ensure that um, people uh, like the indigenous that you were with uh, in Ecuador Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yep. Ecuador. That they and other um, people that um, may not be reaping the great fruits of such uh, emerging markets, uh, how do we ensure that these fruits become democratized and distributed well? So the fruits, uh, by the fruits, do you mean the actual materials or do you mean the fruits of their labor in providing knowledge, right, because intellectual property, these curanderos have some very deep historical intellectual property that they're carrying around with them and do deserve to be compensated for their service. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, how do we do that? We pay for their services directly. So if they fly up to the U.S. to give a training, they should be compensated for their time and we should appreciate what they bring to the table. And that's happening already. Uh, the materials themselves, I think we're a little cautious about moving too fast to commodify the actual materials. Uh, uh, at this point in time, at least from our perspective, we'd rather compensate the individuals who bring the, the service mm. forward. Uh, in, in terms of how we democratize the materials themselves, this is one of our big concerns uh, as decriminalized nature. Uh, we saw what happened in cannabis. I was directly involved in the cannabis industry, um, involved in a business in the cannabis industry. And the extent of uh, greed that sort of prevailed in, in post Prop 64, and I saw it directly, where people were speculating once big capital came in that it just became about assembling as many different dispensaries as you could. It became less about the medic medicinal and healing value of cannabis. It became more about how we can commodify that whole thing. And then there were a lot of people who were pushed out of it. A lot of African-American people who were involved in the industry were suddenly pushed out because they couldn't afford to go through the regulatory process or to get a permit and 
uh, build out for a million dollars plus their manufacturing or their cultivation facility. So a lot of people got pushed out through that process and the downside, additional downside is they were um, restricted on how many plants they could grow. So what we're saying is do whatever you want to do with commodification, with corporatization, with clinical studies, just don't set any limit on what people can grow because then you're allowing people to have a relationship, the same kind of relationship I can have with tomatoes, with lemons, with oranges. Mm. And if people would prefer to go to the store and buy something off the shelf that's produced, then let them. But if they want to grow their own mushrooms or create their own ayahuasca or their own DMT, mm -hmm. then they should have that right. Uh, and so that's how we democratize it, is we allow people mm. to retain that direct, just like tomatoes, right? Direct and access. Until the distribution of, right? Then then there's different frameworks that have to be. Well, no, forever. Forever they should have, it's like tomatoes. We can still go get tomato sauce or buy canned tomatoes, but I can also grow my own. But then if you grow for a million people, then there needs to be some sort of check. Oh, no, what we're, suge what we're suggesting is that people get taught how to grow their own. Oh. If they so choose. That in oh. every community. Oh, okay. People we have get taught how to yeah. grow. Grow their own mushrooms for example, if they want to, right? If they want to learn how to grow their own, there's people there to teach them. And then they can give to their neighbor because then it's safe. Th they can, that's right, yeah. And then it doesn't need to go through a regulatory check because they already learned how to grow. But Yeah, and they're gifting it. It's yeah. like you with tomatoes. As long as, yeah, yeah, as long as they're grown right, yeah. Or that the yeah, eggs are, you know. Well, you can yeah. grow tomatoes and spray a bunch of pesticide all over it. So there's that too, yeah. yeah. But, exactly. but, but we don't. Yeah. We don't regulate you from doing that. Yeah. Right? We, there's a certain level of trust. Trust, yeah. And so we're saying that, put I the see. same rules onto mushrooms. With that same level of trust. That's right. Okay. Because humans aren't as stupid sometimes as we make them out to be. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 yeah. A, it's a nice fiction so that we can have greater control at the higher levels of government. But, and I'm not a libertarian, so this is not coming from a libertarian speak. It's just true, right? And it, it, Michael Pullman had a mushroom journey, a mushroom journey that he spoke about in the book. And uh, by the way, I enjoyed it very much. And then he had several other journeys. And then when they asked him, are you okay with the way decriminalization is rolling out? He said, I'm concerned about uh, safety. So he's concerned about others' safety, but, not, but he's confident in his own abilities to uh, have safety protocols, right? So th there's a certain uh, otherness uh, to that. Oh, so what we're saying is, be okay that everybody can make the same decisions as that you. That you can. That you can, that's right. Everybody's just as smart. Smart. Yeah. We know how yeah. to survive as human beings, generally speaking. <laughs> yeah. So we don't need to have the fear. Interesting. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. That's such a cool way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder where else that can be applied with all of the oversight, top-down oversight that's happening. It's a good question. Yeah. Al although, um, Generally, we don't have the same level of fear and anxiety that we do over things like drugs, right? Or things like cannabis, or things that impact our consciousness, or where the government seems to have drawn a line in 1970 with Nixon was on things that impact our consciousness. Even things like deadly mushrooms, poisonous mushrooms, we seem to be okay with those. It's just things that impact our consciousness yeah. that we seem to have anxiety about as a government yeah. of the people. I have one last question that we sure. like asking on the show. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Life. <sighs> this. Yeah. The alternative is pretty bleak. It's kind of lonely. <laughs> Carlos, your journey's been fascinating, and thank you for all your incredible work. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you having me on. Thank you, thank you for coming on. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Love to hear your thoughts on the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Check out the links to Carlos's work. Also, check out the links to Decrim Nature. Check that out as well. Also, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support New West Summit, where we're at right now. Support Simulation, our show. You can find all our links in the bio below. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Oh, my gosh. That was so great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, was that Thank all right? You. That was so great. Thank you.
Thank you.